Well, what I want to do is um, start off again by by um, offering that that quote that I've been um, sharing from Robert Ferris Thompson um, so often now, found at the end of his book, Face of the Gods. Um, again, just to remind us of this kind of organizing mission statement, if you will. Uh, he says, the beauty and the moral splendor of the Afro-Atlantic faiths reveal them to be world religions, never again to be considered cults, never again to be excluded from the calculus of world religious history. All this sainted difference is what God wants. So for those of you who have been following along over the last several months, we have been able to learn a little bit more about all of these beautiful um, world religions, beginning with Haitian Vodou, we learned a little bit about, and then Cuban Abaqua and its roots in Cameroon, and then about Cuban Palo and its roots in Congo. But you know, we haven't yet touched upon one of the most important cultures that emerged from West Africa, one that can now be found not only in West Africa, but throughout the Americas and not only the Americas either. And what, what I'm talking about, what we're gonna be talking about tonight is Yoruba culture and Orisha worship, which is a form of ritual life with, again, roots in Nigeria, but it's now uh, all over. It's in Cuba, uh, it's here in the United States, it's in Brazil, it's just, it's just everywhere. Now, when I thought about all the people that I might want to reach out to uh, about a presentation on Yoruba culture um, and Orisha worship, there was one person in particular that loomed large, so much so that I have to tell you initially, uh, and John, yeah, I don't mind sharing this. Initially, I was even hesitant to ask. Um, um, John Mason is a Baba Larisha in the Yoruba tradition. He's regarded around the world as one of the most knowledgeable scholars of Yoruba practices. And I frankly thought, man, he's out of reach. He's out of touch. Um, he's the author of so many books, too many to name. I'm, I'm gonna uh, recommend one in particular now. I don't know if you all can see this uh, on, on the screen. It's called Orisha, New World Black Gods. And it's a really, really helpful primer. Uh, for what we'll be learning about from Professor Mason uh, this afternoon. Uh, he's the founder of the Yoruba Theological Arch Ministry in Brooklyn. He was a friend of Robert Ferris Thompson. He's lectured at universities all around the world, and he's helped people to appreciate um, um, or to, to, in some cases, to understand more fully uh, the wisdom and power contained in this beautiful Yoruba tradition. So all that to say, I was really thrilled when Professor Mason responded to my email uh, saying that he would speak to our community. And I've had the chance to uh, uh, speak to him over the phone now a, a number of times. And um, John Mason, let me just say what an honor it is to have you with us. Um, I'm going to turn it over to you, but um, thank you, thank you, thank you for spending a little bit of time um, with us this evening. It, it really is a, a thrill and a treat and an honor um, to be able to welcome you to our community here. So thank you for responding to my invite and for uh, being no, with us. Thank you. Thank you for yeah. even thinking of me. Um, let me sort of bring this down to earth. So <laughs> you should all speak to my wife. Um, <laughs> well, you know something, we've been together We've been married, what, 42 years, I think, 43, 42. Um, don't, and we've been together about 46, 40, maybe, yeah, 46. That's a, there are times when I remember her and she wasn't the person in the whatever story I'm telling. And she'll say, no, that was some other woman. And I'm thinking, there was another woman? Um, <laughs> when you've been with somebody that long, right? and I hope that we go a lot longer. I thought about that, actually. And um, who would have thunk, as Lucille Ball said, I think. I think, it was, I think I'm quoting her. Who would have thunk that um, you, you never... Sometimes, you know, but anyway, it's about bringing things down to earth and um, people that, that make things real. Um, because sometimes 
pe people will say, oh, God, I have a neighbor. And the neighbor said to me once, he says, oh, I heard you write books. And you're supposed to be whatever. And I said, yeah. And he said, you know, I want to write a book. I wanted to. And, but my thought then was not, oh, well, <laughs> good luck. No, my thought was, well, then start. I've been in I've been too many places where fellow priests and priestesses, much more brilliant than I am, and who have more of a grip on history of those specific places. And you wonder about why I would tell them, why don't you write this stuff down when I'm not here? When I come back, we can we can talk more. They, it seemingly, they think it's like a magical process. And I'm thinking it's work. <laughs> you know, I, every day I get up and go to that desk, two desk in the other room. And every day, it's, it's the system. How do you work? And luckily, I love what I do. I'm, it's, it's, I'm endlessly curious about what is that? There's a song, the jazz song, what's that over there? And daddy, who's that over there? And daddy, oh daddy, can I have that big elephant over there? That curiosity of, of youth, I hope I never lose that. Bob Thompson, since you brought him up, he was one of my dear, dear, dear friends. And his curiosity. Mm -hmm. There were two people that I modeled my presentation, my delivery in, in a scholar, scholastic, whatever kind of material. One was a professor when I was in a doctoral program and he, he would walk in with a piece of paper wrapped up and talk about Trotsky and because it was Russian history, it wasn't even African history or anything, but it was Russian history, Middle Eastern history, and he he could go on for an hour, two hours, with no pen, no paper, no notes, nothing, everything from his head. I was totally impressed. I remember once he asked me, Mr. Mason, I never see you take notes in my class. Why is that? So I told him. And he said, can I see your, 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 your notebook? I had a big notebook about that thick. And it was spiral. And he, he said, this is, he says, you went to four years of college with this? I said, yeah. He said, how is that possible? You have all your classes in this one notebook. I said, yeah, I have something close to total recall. Hmm. If I see it. I can, I've been places where people, they say, how do you know how to get back here? I've, I've given, in many countries, I've given cab drivers directions and they're like, how the hell do you know that? You were only here once? It's like a homing pigeon. Once I get, it's like I pay attention. Simple as that. And once I know, no, derecha. No, 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 go right, go right. Cause it's like, they want to take the long route. No, 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 derecha, oye, derecha. So they're like, how does this guy know this stuff? Well, I, I, it's that kind of memory. And that's the only gift I've got, I guess. The rest is basically, then the rest is stud, it's hard work. You study, you, you think about it. Um, I don't go to bed until five sometimes, four in the morning, five in the morning. Sometimes it's light. In, the, in this time of year, it's, it's, I go to bed, I can, I can walk to my bed because I can see, the, I can see. It's, it's the light is coming up. The point is, this work, any type of serious work, music, any, because I'm a musician in, my, in one of my other lives, it requires dedication, it requires discipline. I call it, we have an Odu, we have a, a place in knowledge, a study of knowledge, of all the categories of knowledge. Herman Hess, he wrote a book or Hesse, they say with it, two S's, they say Hesse. Um, Herman Hesse, he wrote Magister Lodi. They call it, it's been retitled the Glass Bead Game. 
It's like the game of life or Monopoly or any of those games. Well, I'm a diviner. I study the ultimate game. <laughs> it's better than I Ching. It's more inclusive. And as I, a friend, a dear friend of mine, a boyhood friend who became a master of, of I Ching, we talked once and I said, Loda, his, his nickname was Loda of all names. I said, Loda, can you fight from the pentagram when you create, when you throw the yarrow sticks or you, throw, you, you flip coins? Can you fight from, what, from the resulting um, diagram, information? He said, fight. I said, yeah, fight. Can you reach out? He said, oh, no, it's not, it's not built for that. I said, well, then in my system, you can fight from the board, hmm. which, which means that I can step into the other world. That's not always, <laughs> you get older, there's certain steps you don't want to take because it's a little bit tricky. But it's this idea that matter can neither be created nor destroyed. That means everything, you, me, everything has always been and always will be in one form or the other. Let me read that because this I'm going to read so that people don't think that I'm just because I could ramble and, that I, and I'll be here a week and you say, what did he say? All right. Um, I made a title for this because this came out of, um, <clears throat> excuse me. It's called Diaspora at the Turn. A new world to make, a brass ring to snare, unless we forget. A picture is not a thousand words if it does not answer the questions of who, what, when, where, how, and why in regard to the portrayed people, their lives and arts. To do that, honestly, we must become part of a community and share its hopes, dreams, plans, pains, and pleasures. Its mothers and fathers must become our mothers and fathers. Its children must become our children, or we are nothing more than not gone native academic voyeurs, moving from one titillating photo to the next. Bob Thompson, we had this conversation a long time ago. God, you think that, where did 50 years go? Because I don't know where I'd look back on the road. The road had been, somebody had picked up the road. I got a critic. Um, <laughs> the dog says, I'm not a critic. <laughs> okay. It says, who will speak for us? Abducted children of Africa who, found, who find ourselves at home so far and so many years from home. We must speak and record our histories seen slash public and unseen slash private in order to build Ashe, which is command power. This is what began for me 60 years ago, more. I've been a priest 52 years and initiated priest 52 years. And then the years before that, where I was sort of searching to find out what it was that I really believed in or that made sense to me. Um, when I was younger, I was raised a Catholic. And when they found out that I wasn't, <laughs> as, as young Frankenstein said, <laughs> I was Abbey normal. Um, in the sense that they gave me a, a IQ test and my mother and father who were blind and my father was very well educated. He had graduated from divinity school. He was a, going to be a doctor of divinity until he lost faith that God had made a black man in that year, that time blind. That didn't seem to go with his theory of, of benevolence. So, but I never forget the, the nun, they told my mother, do you know how much he scored 
on this IQ test. And I was, it was supposedly something for them that meant that I was ooh, quite smart, um, whatever that meant. But it meant that I was not, I was really way above normal what they could, and really way above that. So they were like, wow. And my mother said, well, in her very soft way, she said, I always thought he was quite intelligent. My wife didn't believe that my mother taught me to read. My blind mother taught me and my cousins all to read. I was reading at two years old because I had to go with my mother and describe street signs when we traveled together, her and my father. And I would, she said, tell me the numbers, John. And I'd tell her the numbers and tell me the street. What street are we at? And I, I don't remember. And I tell, my, I tell my, all my children, do you ever remember a time you didn't know how to read? That's an amazing and wonderful gift. So that it's in that, that for me to understand what is it that I believe? What is God? What does it mean to be human? What is this thing that we are now experiencing, this incarnation, this existence? Well, that begins the quest because now it's like, okay. And then you find, where do you put your feet that you can stand firmly on, on solid ground for you? Everybody's different. Everybody finds, some people can work on surfboards. Some people work on, on, on roller, on you know, skateboards. So other people work on roller skates. Other, some people have to stand on solid ground um, so that there is no good or bad. It's only, what do you do with it? What is it? What is it for? So it says, did we mourn the passing of the Atlanteans? When we when in English we clearly and articulately present our grievances and accurately describe and point out the evildoers, the white jurors ask for our charges and testimony to be subtitled and read to them by a translator. Is there any wonder why I'm pissed off? This is tragedy, not by accident, but by design. All religious doctrines demand that their followers have and keep faith in the ultimate power, wisdom, and righteousness of their particular mysteries. It then follows that the mysteries are bound by the faith, by this faith, to perform, perform, perform. Failure to do so in the moment of crisis prompts the adherent to call foul and move to put aside his, her, covenant. Our identity is shaped by our beliefs. The unifying themes of African systems of worship focus on the relationship of the individual to the spiritual realm populated by unseen powers, those yet to be born, and the ancestors. They can be summed up as follows. One, Africans believe there is one God who created and controls the universe and all that is contained therein. When I say Africans, there is, to my knowledge, no country or people on the continent who do not have this, who do not share this belief. This idea that there is one unifying force that controls it all. Call it whatever name you will, and there are names for every place they have a name. So the Yoruba say, Olo Dumari, Olo Fiend. Depending on what it is you're talking about, there are various names for the one that controls the law, that controls the sun, that controls the ability to be dazzling. All of those things are, in other words, another names for God. So 
But the idea is, or the, the, the proof is that no matter where you go in Africa, you find this, this unifying ideal that it all boils down to one thing. Now, I have gone a little bit further in my exploration because in one of the books that I've written, I did, a, which I'm still, which is the next edition is going to make the first edition obsolete, actually. But in praise of our mothers, women, which we will talk about in this little short passage as I move on, but God, like the world that we live in, the majority of godliness has to be feminine. Men don't produce children. We help, but we are not the carrier. It is not flesh of our flesh in the sense that it doesn't come from our loins. It doesn't issue from us. It's, it is not that, we do not create that miracle. As much as we, we, we covet it and we look at it and we try to control it, women, so that in my estimation, my humble estimation, the feminine in God is more. I didn't say better, which I, somebody, we had it, it's the people look for arguments. No, you, no, it's like, no, I didn't say better. I said more. That the, fe the feminine is created to be accommodating. So that even the words that the British came up with when they asked, they said, well, what are those ladies? Those are Ajay. And they says, well, what does that mean? That means witch. No, that's a terrible. Matter of fact, there's no way, there's no way that word could mean witch. Since I, I put this, as my dear friend pointed out, he said, if you're not a linguist, trained as a linguist, I'm not trained as an art historian, but language is my tool. I discovered if you don't know what the language is, if you don't understand it intimately, you don't understand the culture. So that for a Christian, if you really want to understand what Christ said, you have to read Aramaic because the King James Version is not <laughs> what Christ said, or what anybody said, quite honestly, ex that hasn't been paraphrased. Now, I am not, a, as I let people understand, I am not a Christian, I have no dog in this race, but since I am a, a noted, whatever that means, scholar, historian, theologian, then that becomes, it, it's germane to this conversation because then if you want to explain to me what they said, tell me in the language which they spoke. Decipher that. And then we have cl some clarity. Because sometimes it's, it's like saying in Spanish, trying to translate, you're the apple of my eye, darling. In Spanish, that doesn't quite, oh, Masana de mi ojo, it's like apple in your eye. What the hell is that? What does that mean? It doesn't make any sense. So they're going idioms, idiomatic expressions, moving from one language to another, start to unravel and come apart, and they don't make any sense for, for <laughs> the listener generally. And a lot of times it, dis, it, it, it um, destroys the intent of the speaker because it, it, now he's got to, he or she's got to explain, well, no, I didn't mean that, I meant this. Well, that is what got me into this position that I, I don't know, whatever position I'm in is the position of studying language, studying what does that actually mean? What did they mean when they said that? When you have what they call oriki, you have praise poems, praise that the names of God, what do they translate? For the Yoruba, uh, uh, my dear friend Henry Drew told me once, he said, you scare a lot of people. 
I said, what do you mean I scared them? He said, you untie knots that were never meant to be untied. There are names for things that I remember old people, people that taught me that when they said certain around and bite themselves and, and make certain, because they had to disavow their connection with that blasphemy. Certain names cannot be said just helter skelter. Oh, anyway, you know, people use names for things. It's, it's the same way in, in, in Hebraic that they, you don't call God's name just because you got something to say. It's like, it better be something very weighty, something important. God is not to be addressed. So for the Yoruba, God cannot even be called. God is not here. God has left all these agents. He left the wind. She left the wind. He, she, doesn't matter. Gender is not even important, even though gen tend, they tend to make it more he than anything else, which I find somewhat disarming because it, it's not accurate in the sense of language or in the sense of what the actual job of God is or what the jobs that God does, put it that way. So this idea of shaping your beliefs and that this one God who can creates, who created and controls the universe and all that is contained therein, then Africans believe too that there are selected forces of nature which deal with the affairs of mankind on earth and govern the universe in general. And the word selected has to be underlined in that conversation, in that descriptive, because it is not just, oh, anything, pick a number. No, it requires, the idea of selection requires thinking, requires reflection. Did you reflect on what that is and what, and why it is and what why should it be this why should we call it that why should it be given this position it's it's deliberation is in, is is in, it's critical in any idea of of the sacred or anything basically that's important that you should think about it it's not just something you say oh pick take pick a number it's any number no any number doesn't quite suffice here so that you when you think about what makes the wind go? What makes lightning lightning? What makes fire burn? What makes love so critical to living? We have a saying, well, we'll get to that because I'll, I'll be in front of myself here all day. Um, so Africans believed, believe the spirit of man lives on after death and, re and can reincarnate back into the world of men. The idea of reincarnation, as the physicists tell us, matter can neither be created nor destroyed. You and I and we have been either dancing this dance in a thousand other worlds, in a thousand other lifetimes, in other forms, from time. We've never not been. That's the point of this that at least if, if their analysis is correct and matter can neither be created nor destroyed, and matter means everything, all right? The smoke that you don't see, the smoke that you do see, the gas that you don't smell, the gas that you do smell, all of those things are constantly in flux so that we are constantly in flux. You know, I remember years ago, and somebody I read this thing. And the guy said, or the the person said, I say guy all the time. Um, they said, oh, every seven years we fluff off a whole beam. We be we renew ourselves because our our cells regenerate and they get rid of the old stuff, and we could take a bath. And God, all I got to do is look under, look at my look at the side of my bed every couple of months, and all of that dust and stuff. That's me. <laughs> down there that I pull it out. And I'm like, oh, shucks, where did it come from? And my wife says, where did all this dust come from? I said, from us, from us and whatever else is blowing in the street. And the answer, my friend, is blowing in the wind. <laughs> so 
And the answer is Joe, Sam, Susie, and, and, and Elmo. Um, they're all blowing in the wind. But that's the God design. That we go and we come and we come and we go and we disappear and we reappear. And you think, I'm writing, I, I write stories to people say, you write other stuff? Yeah, I write other stuff. I have a dear friend, um, oh, dear friend, a good friend, let's put it that way, because he might say, I'm not that dear. Um, Walter Mosley, he did Devil in the Blue Dress and, and a whole bunch of, he's, he's, look, I think, boy, he must, you think I get up early and write, he must get up and not go to bed because he writes, it's like, damn, you wrote all those books? He says, well, you, you, you're not that bad yourself. I said, yeah, but good God. Um, the point being, you come up with glimpses of people and things that are not just imaginary, they're real. I said, where did you get Mouse from? I, I knew people like Mouse. Mouse was a psychopathic murderer, but he was this guy's best friend. I've had people, I've known a few people like that who said, John, how's your mom? They love my mother. My father, they could, eh, but my mother, oh my God. But now don't leave them alone with 14 people because you come back and there'd be, there'd be only 12 left. <laughs> so it's like, oh my goodness, why did you kill those people? They were there. Um, it's, how's your mom, John? Oh my God. You, you know, it's, it's, yeah. So that, the ability to be and to not be is all part of this spiritual power and all of this is coming. So it says, remember it. Okay, I'm trying to figure out where I left. Oh, here I am. Africans believe ancestral spirits have power over those who remain on earth and must be remembered, appeased, honored, and consulted by the living. I talked to my mother and I apologize to my father. As I get older, I was looking, I shaved. I didn't want to come as a hairy monster. So I shaved yesterday to get prepared for this. And I looked and I had my father's lips and this, this mustache pointed that out. I said, good God, that's, that's dad's lips. <laughs> why are they on my body? Anyway, I know why. The point being that I remember when I wanted to be, I told him I was going to be a priest. I was going to be initiated. And remember, he was theologian. He had, he, had, he, he was in, he was, he was that far from being a doctor of divinity until his, he lost his sight and he lost faith. But he, he put me through the, the questions. He said, does it have doctrine? Does it have this? He asked me about five questions. And when I answered all of them to his satisfaction in the affirmative, he said, okay. He said, let me, let me give you one piece of advice. He said, you see, Dr. King, he's Dr. King. He's not a jack leg. I said, Pop, what's a jack leg? He said, the jack leg preacher is somebody who gets a soapbox, puts it in the corner, and takes the Bible and starts preaching from inspiration. He gets the calling to preach, but he's not learned in the scripture. He hasn't studied. He doesn't know one thing from the other. He knows something, but he doesn't know. He says, but Dr. King is a, is a, is a cultured, studied man. He... In other words, this is what he does. He studies the, the, the scripture. That was his charge to me. If I count anything, there are one or two others, Bob. Yeah, I, met, I, I fashioned after Bob and Professor Rosen. And yeah, I got that. But my father was always the one behind my head saying, you're not, if whatever you do, know what you're talking about. Study what you believe. Well, that's what I've been doing for the last 50 some close to 60 years. 
That is what this is about. That that spirit is who I am answering to. My mother's spirit, my grandmother, all I just I've written, I just have a book finished with with stories from <laughs> that interesting past. Um, and there are many more, there are many stories, but you figure it's those ancestors upon whose shoulders I stand. We all have to look back. However, checkered you might think that is and that's for you to decide that's not for me i can say you know something your 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 uncle your father your this was a real this or that or a great person um and you might think likewise or you might think differently you might say you know he was a real son of a gun as abbott and costello pointed out um so it's in that that ancestral worship is, and worship is a funny word, it's respect, it's honor, that this is what gave birth to me. This is what I stand upon, for better or worse. You can't beat yourself up if X, Y, or Z was the case. You can only make sure you don't follow. If it's a negative, you don't want to go that direction. Unless, as a friend of mine said, it's a prophet in it. The guy said, well, God damn, you can't. The guy says, well, John, you never, you can't turn down a $2. So I didn't quite agree with that. But I understood his point of view that some people rationalize even that. But that's for them. But in this particular case, you can only honor, especially in, for the Yoruba and for many West, many African and especially West Africans, you cannot honor Jesse James. You cannot bring that Jesse James character into, they do it in movies, but that cannot be done if you're saying we're going to have a celebration of goodness, of wonderful, of our ancestors. You try and pick out those stellar celebrities in, in the in the in the clan. Um, and that is pretty much the basis of this convers of this particular point here. It says that that believe ancestral spirits have powers over those who remain and those powers have to be aimed towards goodness. Goodness in the sense of you want your children to live to be old to bury you. All right. You want you you want you don't want to you don't want to starve in the middle of of of, of plenty. You don't you you, you want to be able to earn a, a decent living. All of those things that any rational person would say, yeah, you know, I, I don't I don't who wants to suffer unless you're really into that. Then fine. If that's your thing, if that's your your view of heaven, have at it. Um, but if not then when you call, when I pray to my ancestors, to my aunts and uncles and grandmothers and grandfathers, going back to whatever, I ask them to help me towards goodness, help me towards plenty. And I don't mean plenty where I'm already big enough. I don't need any more food. I just want to, matter of fact, as I get older, I'm finding out I have less of an appetite, which is maybe God saying, see, I told you. Um, all of that becomes cri critical in this. Africans believe in divination. They believe that with the, and what is divination? Here's with the correct knowledge, investigation, implementation, and sacrifice, the means to solve all problems and cure all ills are within our grasp. It's, this is not, faith healing. This is not, oh, no, this is scientific method. Actually, it, it predates it, people talking about the scientific method by at least three or 4,000 years easy. So that, why? Because it requires observation, empirical information. What happened when you eat this? What I always think of all the foods that the line between, I have books, forget, I have, people said, damn, you study, you study um, plant life? I have books, forget it. 
I've written about, about medicine. I study medicine. Why? Because I'm always in, in, impressed by how did they know that wouldn't kill them dead? If you eat this part of it, it's okay. If you eat, you have, think about an ackee apple. In, in the, in, in, you eat the wrong part of that, you, you're a sick, dead person. One part is nutritious, the other part is deadly poison. There are so many plants that fit that category that you can't eat, but you figure how many people died <laughs> testing that plant. This, Joey, eat that. <laughs> Get Joey. Joey eats everything. Okay, Joey, come on. And, and then he wipe Joey slowly choked to death. And you say, okay, put down. Joey died, but you cannot eat this. Don't eat that plant. But actually, it's that type of empirical observation that's actually more than because if we do it in, in medicine, we do it's what do you think? What, how many people are not taking their boosters? I, I just heard from a dear friend who's, who's supposed to be a smart, smart guy, and him and his wife are both teeter tottering on the effects of, of COVID. And I'm, I, the first I said, Well, didn't you guys get inoculated? Oh, no, 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 and I won't even tell you the rationale for that. So, because I, we've been talking about divination every year we divine for the year, all right, for the house, for, the, for our family, for the, for, and that's not just my, my immediate family, but the Orisha family that, that's connected to this um, temple, put it that way. And it said, don't argue. We were advised, do not argue with anybody about taking COVID tests. Why? Because it's it's it can lead to all kinds of bad blood and and people have already made up their minds about certain things. It's like somebody wanting to commit suicide. What are you going to sit there and you know? It's no, I'm not going to argue with you. You want to you want to jump? Jump. Go ahead. Take, take you know take the leap. Do me a favor. Don't hit my car. A friend of mine said that I I don't have a car anymore. But so believe in divination so that we can. But investigation, implementation, and sacrifice. Sacrifice is the, doesn't mean you kill 13 goats, pigeons, or whatever. No, it means I get up every morning and go to that desk. That means I get up and I study. I've been all around the, too many places in the world. Why? Because I want to know what that is. And I don't want to hear somebody tell me about what it is. I want to know what it is. What is that? What, how does it work? How does it feel? What does it smell like? Um, my, again, I'm going to mention Henry in the same lecture twice. That's so maybe more. Henry's he's working on this, on this thing. He says, because you have to know what, if you've been in any type of ritual situation, the heat, the smells, the, 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 the human um, company, all of that is part of your knowledge of something. And it has to be thought about. Everybody thinks that they're just running through the world. No. What did you bump into? What did you, what, what did you smell? What did you feel? What noise did you hear? All of that is part of ritual. It's part of belief. It's, it's, it's what helps form your belief. So that divination is that thing too. It's knowing and it's going into your own memory, your own experiential reality. What did you experience? Because sometimes the only way, some things you can't know unless you've experienced it in some form. You can, you can theorize, you can tell all kinds of nice stories. Oh, you can, you can give all kinds of wonderful advice. My father used to say this all the time. He says, you know something? You can tell somebody all day what a kick in the butt feels like. The only way they're going to really know what a kick in the butt feels like is when they get kicked in the butt. Because there's something immediate. There's something now. And you can't explain it because they, if, until you've been kicked, until you've experienced certain things, it's even... Because it's all fiction for you. It's because you people say, "Oh, I'm going to give good advice. You shouldn't do that. You shouldn't do." So how do you know you shouldn't do that? 
How do you know? How do you know what the result, how that person might experience it in a different way? But divination, what is divination in this sense? The Jews call it Talmud. It's in the Torah, but it's a Talmudic. It's the listing of all the arguments about a cow, all the arguments about a this or that. In other words, and what? how did they resolve that problem? That is what fa is. It's the glass bead game. It's a game that everything in the universe, everything in our world is in my game. I call it my game, but it's not mine because there are other diviners. No one diviner can know it all because no matter how much medicine I study, there are people that know more medicine. There's, there's, I went to my doctor, I'm doing this, this thing on dolls and I showed him a picture, a very old terracotta. I said, tell me what killed this person. I got two, my doctor and another doctor, his, his, his associate, and they looked and they gave me a complete diagnostic. They said, oh, this person died of malnutrition, um, congenital heart failure, da 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 but the boom. They gave a whole, and they both, not talking to each other, gave me exactly the same breakdown. Why? Because sometimes you need to know when you look at a person, when, when people come for divination, I'm looking at them. I'm examining them. I'm looking to see what, do they tremor? Do they do this? Do they do that? Can they have balance? Because there are different techniques that we learn as diviners, as priests. Why? Because all of this is helping us get to an answer. And what is that answer? What medicine to take? What can we do to help this person survive? That doesn't mean that it's it's failed, it's foolproof, it oh no, you don't worry. No, and it's not faith healing, it's empirical observation, it's fact, it's knowing what this will do in the body. What this there are things that you take for high blood pressure. Well, it, it, when they went into the in, into the tropics and they discovered quinine, I'm sure it didn't come in, in little bottles in pill shape so that they had to go to a tree and figure out how to take that. And, and what did the natives use? How did they take that quinine and that bark and those elements and make them into medicine? There is a process and that process is what we study. It's, but it's it, and the processes that'll take me to the end of my life and hopefully to the next one and, and others because it's, I'm not the only person studying. So all of that, is where this belief in divination, and that the word divination has to be understood in this because everybody thinks it's, oh, you're gonna tell me every, no, I went to a, what, what put me on this course to be a priest. I went to a person, my teacher, he told me some, he told me things that only the FBI or somebody with a mic in my bedroom could know. Okay, I didn't always, I wasn't always a saint. so. I wanted to know how he did that, all right? Because I did, I'm not, I was an agnostic in those years. I didn't, my thing was, what's that old saying? I'm from Missouri, prove it. And I wasn't slow. As, as, in other words, I was really very smart. So that, not, I'm not as smart now, but I was smarter then. And so that I was paying attention to but I couldn't see the moving parts. I said, how the hell did you do that? How did you know that? Because there's no way you could have known that. Well, that set me on my path. I wanted to be a diviner. I didn't care about the rest of the stuff. It was like, hey, I wanna know how to do that. And some people said I, I haven't done badly and other people say, eh. <laughs> an, old, an old woman told me, you're all right. You'll be better in about five, 10 more years. I said, thank you, man. Thank you, mother. I had to let leave it because she was so, she, she was just the sweetest woman, but she told me that. She said, you'll be all right in about five or 10 more years. You'll be the, you'll be the cast me out. So that kind of thing. So I said, okay. So Africans believe in the use of offerings 
and blood sacrifice to elevate their prayers to the spiritual powers and the ancestors. When I say offerings, it doesn't, offering is anything from labor to denial. You know, I won't eat this, I won't do that. I, that knowing your, I always, I told somebody this the other day, I said, you know, the thing, that, the most important thing in living sometimes, knowing your limitations. I'm not God. I'm not even in the same room, <laughs> I don't think, on a lot of days. So here's the point. You got to know where you end and the rest of everything begins so you don't overstep your bounds. That is, is sometimes that's a sacrifice. And that's what this sort of implies. African, now, Africans believe in magic. They believe that magic occurs when we use our heads and our abilities to become dazzling so that we can counter or frustrate evil, thus illuminating the source of the problem. Magic is the ability to transform things. For example, negativeness into goodness. Magic is a technique, all right? If you wanna know real magic, tell me how babies come out of that little cell. Those two things come together, sperm and egg, and we end up with me, you, us. Now that's magic. And yet and still, we try and simulate it, do it, do it, and we generally screw it up. But somewhere along the line, God, nature, being came up with the answer. And not just for me and you and for us as humans, but for everything. Everything has to regenerate itself, create that ability to birth. That is magic. So everything else is technique from, from the Yoruba point of view, that we have to learn what is technique. Even the idea is, is like when you, I remember Creston. I don't know if you're, you people know who Creston was. He was a mentalist. I remember I was in a parade and I, they got me to, to make the prayer, to open the parade, the Thanksgiving, not Thanksgiving, Halloween parade in, here in, in New York. And Kreskin was there and I never, I seen Kreskin on television and here is the, the, the wonderful Kreskin. And I'm like, hey, hi, I know you. And you know, I've, I've seen you for how many years? And we talked and um, nothing earth shattering, but it was just basically you realize that as a friend of mine said, you see, everybody goes to the same bathroom, basically. <laughs> so it's like, it's Kreskin, it's Kreskin. And somebody said, that, you know, I told people, I said, I talked to my wife, because what the hell? You know, I, I'm, yeah, oh, John Mason, oh my God. Yeah, well, I, I've, met, I've met a bunch of people that you think, my goodness, here I am in the same room with so-and-so, and, and they're like, yeah, right, isn't that wonderful? And, you know, and, and I'm always amazed that they're, because you get older, you realize, yeah, this is, you know, something sooner or later, we're going to be viewed. <laughs> yeah, that, somebody told me that. That was the end of that story. Anyway, so this idea of offerings, blood sacrifice, and magic, um, this idea of how do we frustrate evil? That's the magic, frustrating evil. And evil, what is evil? We'll get, because then evil is all those things that God has placed in the world, death, sickness, loss, all those, they call them the ajogun, those things that make war on mankind, or make war on everything, basically. Everything dies. Everything can, things get sick. Things, things lose. Um, things get overwhelmed. Um, so that all of this is part of the, the divine plan that there is, there are forces that are clearing the deck and you cannot, I just finished a story in, that's going to come up in a book. Um, there's a series of books that we're producing this year. And there's a story about how they capture death. The son of Obatala captures, captures death and he brings, they bring death to, to, to him and he says, okay, Baba, Father, Punish this guy. Eliminate death. You have the power to eliminate death. And Obatala says, no. I cannot eliminate death. 
death has a power, a, a purpose in this universe, in this world that we live in. Because if not, if we didn't have death, we would have stagnation. We'd have, we'd have putrefaction. We'd have th that the water would turn putrefied. We couldn't drink water because there would be nothing, there would be no way of clearing out the old that, that when it gets to a certain point, you gotta go. That's as simple as that. You gotta go. Um, and we have so many words in our culture and I'm saying our the Orisha culture about some things are worse than death. I pointed, I'm a diviner and I've told people, I said, you know, we have a, there's a, there's a category. It says you can live so that all of your friends, all of the people of your generation are dead and you're the last one standing. Sometimes being the last one standing ain't so hot because nobody knows who the hell you are. It's, and, oh, please, a friend of mine, dear friend, he passed on, Morton Sanders. I never forget Morty. Morty told me, he said, he called me up, John. Hey, Morty, how you doing? He was a brilliant, he was an architect by profession, but he, he, he was probably, one of the greatest carvers I've ever known. And I, believe me, I've known some carvers. Um, and <laughs> he sold an African drum to this African dealer. He sold it to, a, he, he gave it to the, the dealer to, to put in the window. The guy sold it to this real Rasta nationalist. The Rasta sees Morty. He says, Morty, Morty, look at this drum. Did I, got, it's an African drum, man. Look at this drum. And Morty said, John, I had to bite my tongue. If I had told him this white Jew boy built, called that drum, he would have killed me. Killed me and the dealer who sold it to him as, an, as a Congolese drum, because that's how good Morty was. I have books of his that he, 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 um, he, he got crazy. At the end, he started selling stuff. He sold some very rare books. And I went to the bookstore and I said, He's a more, I said, the only person I ever seen with these books is Morton Sanders. He says, yeah, Morty sold them to me. I said, son of a bitch, excuse my French. Why would he sell them to you? He could have sold them to me. He says, no, he wouldn't. He said, John, I, I couldn't. He said, I gave them to the book dealer. So I said, well, you know, I paid, you know what I paid for those books, man? Because I had to buy them. The point being, the idea that You come with a gift, you come with a gift and Morty had the gift, but people, as he said, he called me up. He said, I'm old. I said, yeah, and is there some other news you're gonna tell me? He said, I don't like it. I don't like being, he was always a vital person. And I said, Morty, this is part of the package, brother. I'm older than him now. Well, then, then he turned out to be, I believe. No, he, he lived a little, little more, but he got to the point. He said, I don't like being old. I said, what do we do? There ain't nothing to do. This is part of the, this is part of the, the deal. In for a penny, in for a pound. So this is part of the sacrifice too, so that we, we don't lose, don't think I'm just rambling here. It's about what do we sacrifice in order to live this incarnation, to learn, to fill this thing with information for the next time, that whatever that means, because I don't know what the next time is gonna be, where it's gonna be, how I'm gonna look, what I'm gonna be, but, the plan is while you're here, keep filling the cup. Keep filling the cup because that's all we have. That's what this, that's the sacrifice that's being made. Um, Africans believe in the magical and medicinal use of herbs. We don't have to go into that too much more. Africans believe that ritual song and dance are mandatory in the worship of God and ancestors. Why? 
years ago I was at, I went to, to um, hear a, a um, what do you call it, audit a class up at City College. Never forget, a friend of mine was taking this course with this um, <laughs> later to be, I won't mention any names. He turned out to be disappointing, but he said something which was actually quite accurate. When you pray, when you sing, the way I'm talking to you now, I can't sing that way, all right? So you say, hey, Baba, my voice changes. I become more nasal. The quality of my voice, and I'm not, that's not me attempting to do that. That's just the way it comes out. And after doing something for 60 years, it just becomes natural. But again, it's that transformation of voice, of intonation, of octave even, your octave range shifts. All of that is part of belief. Why? Because on a certain wavelength, you can make things happen or not happen, materialize and dematerialize things so that it's that ability of sound to have power. That's what this is about. <clears throat> That's what it's pointing to, that the, it's not just singing for singing. It's singing with an aim. Why are we sing? We're trying to bring something to materialize in the room, in the space that we're now con, con, um, centered in. So that it's in that ability to create a sonic wave, a sonic presence. And that presence has all kinds of, ability, of abilities depending on knowledge, because then again, language is implied. It implies a lot of what's happening. I, I explained this to some, some drummers who considered themselves quite accomplished. And I pointed out to them that they didn't know what they were doing because they couldn't speak the language. See that there's certain, it's not just me singing. It's me singing and speaking and directing that energy in a specific way at a specific person or group of people for a specific result. And it's not done haphazardly. It's, as I explained to many great, uh, great and not so great musicians and drummers and singers, if you're not thinking, you're not, it's, it's basically, fool's play. Why? Because it requires, if you listen to Pavarotti, some of his, and you, Channel 13, I, I, they, they stopped playing it. He would, he would that famous, famous um, they caught him in a performance. Every time I hear it, it makes me cry every time. And I'm thinking why I'm sitting here like a fool crying over this man's reaching this crescendo of sound and, 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 and passion. Varying degrees, other singers, eh, not like him. And I've, I've been a musician, God darn long. Matter of fact, I've been a musician damn near longer than he was alive. The point being, when you notice that about some power in the music, that this particular thing, it catches, it, it touched something in me and I, you feel it. Then you realize, wow, I can imagine him singing at a ritual. If, if he had, with those, with what he can do and what he understands he can do and directing that. Well, that's, I know singers on at least three, four, three continents who would, who would make him dance, okay? It would make Pavarotti dance because they would sing and they would, they would touch him in places he didn't even know he had. So that 
That is what this music is talking about. That ritual song and dance are mandatory, that the singing and the movement all re brings on another dimension of reality. That's the point. It's, it, it opens other doors so that there are so many ways of opening other portals to other ways of seeing existence. This is one of them. All of these are in play. So it's not just using medicine, using this, using, it's all about A. And this is what the culture teaches. It's, well, and not everybody knows these things at the same level. As my teacher would point out, he said, you know, some people, they just go for the, and they, uh, other people know how to make the thing move. Not everybody knows how to be a race car driver. There are a lot of people that drive cars, some, some worse than others, as, as the accident rate points out. But they're not Mario um, Andretti, is his name? Yeah, Mario. They're not him. They're not or any of those, any of, with that skill set. So that it takes a certain amount of training and the natural ability that you can, so that that's all implied in this, that this is just not, oh, but all of these things are portals, ways of learning, ways of excelling, a ways of, of making things in the world and in the universe happen. So that, and it's sonically driven. All right, the Yoruba used the word Ogbon to mean art, intelligence, cunning, wisdom, ingenuity, skillfulness, wit, and invention. You say, wow, one word. Yeah, that's the trouble with Yoruba um, and, and a few other West African languages. Um, you move that little diacritic left, right, and up, and one has, one doesn't. Ooh, we get a whole array of meaning. But in this case, that one word, people say, oh, it means wisdom. No, it means more. To be wise is to be artful, to be intelligent, to be cunning. Wisdom is one of them, but it's, and to be ingenious, ingenuity. If you're really wise, you cannot leave out the ingenuity part that that person is ingenious. Why? And it might not be, they, you know, they can't rebuild a Ford or they can't redo this, or they, but in some aspect, if, and if they discover it, ooh, it's discovering your wisdom. It's discovering your ingenuity. It's discovering your cunning. My mother, my father and mother had what, two different personalities, which is, people say, well, that's obvious. Um, my father is brilliant he, as he was. I think, he, and, and this it took me a long time to, to reason this out. He came from a very well-to-do black family in the South. His father was a very prominent lawyer, my grandfather, and yada, yada. And they went on from that. He and his brother went to, they went to school, they went to college, they, for, for, for two black men, oh God, that was big stuff. And then he went to divinity school, his, his, his brother became a lawyer, all of this stuff. And then the depression, as my father points out, they went to the bank. He said his father had $50,000 in the bank. He had seven. They gave them folding money, 10 cents on the dime. And they went from being so well to do. My father said in, they lived in North Carolina. Salzburg, and he said they had a house that people used to come to just to look at. That's how beautiful the house was. Now I never, I've never been there, never saw it. I've never been to that part because I certain. My father used to tell me when I was young. He said, "With that mouth, stay out of the South." Okay, no, he, that and he was. I learned much later when I was supposed to be somebody, and people said, "Hey, professor, don't go out of here at night." I was on. What, University of, of um, University of Florida in, in Gainesville. They said, don't go out of here at night by yourself walking around. 
And I said, what's the problem? Now we're on this big ass campus and I'm thinking, and they, guy, they give, we're going to eat lunch. And the guy said, you see this tree? <laughs> they lynched a, a black man here. And I'm thinking, oh, wow, this happened, you know, in the day. He said, no, this happened last year. And I'm like, are you kidding me? He said, no, nah, professor, don't go out by yourself. And always go with somebody that knows where you're going. And I'm like, wow. And I thought of my father immediately. I said, dad, pop, because I didn't call him dad. I said, pop, wow, you were right. Because um, to this day, I don't know how to hold my tongue. <laughs> so it's like, and I, oh, anyway, I won't tell those stories. Um, but that reality about wisdom, my mother would be, oh, thank you, darling. If you came up to my father, he's waiting to cross the street and you grabbed him under his arm. Come on, Mr. Mason, let me go. Come on, Pop. It, you know, he was, come on, sir. And he would, you don't know how to grab a man, a blind man. And then, and, and I mean like that, because <laughs> he, he wasn't afraid of, of most people. And when we got, my brother and I became men. Most people know, whatever you do, leave that man alone because he's got two sons you really don't want to have to deal with, all right? Um, I wasn't always a nice guy. So, but the point I'm making, my mother knew how to say, oh, thank you, darling. Thank you. And there was that dichotomy of approaches to wisdom because Pop don't argue with him about the Bible because you would end up losing. I've seen many people that were supposedly well tutored, learned, and Pop would, would, would shut them down. He would say, no, no, because he spoke Greek and Latin. Because when he was in school, that's what you had. You had he says, I remember I took Latin in, in high school. And he said, he started quoting the Caesar's Gallic Wars. And I'm like, are you kidding me? He says, you don't know that. And he started speaking Latin to me. And I'm like, how the hell do you know that? He says, I studied Latin and Greek, the Bible in those languages. And I'm like, are you kidding me? He says, no, because that was his way of making me sort of toe the line. It's like, hey, don't treat this seriously. So here we go. Um, this idea of what is wisdom? skillfulness, wit, invention, this idea coupled with the term eton for tale or history and tom for diaspora, to propagate, to investigate, to shine and to trick helps us to understand that for the Yoruba art, it's a propagation and investigation of wisdom. All art, whether it's writing, singing, dancing, you're trying to understand what is how do we propagate and investigate wisdom? And all the terms that I use for that word, Ogbon, because Ogbon is, it's, 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 it's not just one word, it's a whole cadre of words, of terms. It, it's, a, it's a category of, of understanding that in order for you to be, quote, wise, all those other things have to sort of um, follow suit. Art, like spirit, is meant to shine, to, to be seen, be heard, to trick, and cause a double take of the signified, a reinvestigation. It is supposed to rue, carry you, rue, stir things up, incite you, rue. These are all ways of that, that word can be are in, implied here. Rue to move you to be either angry or sad. That's what all these arts are supposed to do that. By this very definition, spirit and art are meant to travel, spreading the news about all things sacred and mundane. It all begins with God, the ideal. So that all art is basically 
a reflection of God. It's a reflection of your godliness. Of every artist is in is I put this in order for me to create anything, tiles, any, anything, ceramics. It's God that's in there. It's that God. It's the ability to be creative, to create something that you, that wasn't there before. It, it's the work that we do. It's the book that we, the music that we create. It's it's when you. Um, I told somebody. I told people in my in my orchestra. I said, they said, well, why don't you don't play Monk? I love the you know, the. <laughs> Oh, I love I love Monk. I love my I love a lot of good great musicians, female and male. The point being, I don't play their music. Why? Because I've I got there's there's piles of music right there on on a on a xylophone that I have set up in my bedroom because I used to do. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a octave, two, almost two octaves, and it gives you enough information to, to, to move, to deal with chord progression. So it's fine. I don't have, I don't need to have a piano up there. This is as good as that. But the point being, you only got one life. I'm not going to play Duke Ellington. I don't care how much I like it. I'm not going to play Monk I'm, as much as I love him. I'm not going to play a bunch of people. Why? Because I have a pile of music over there that I want to hear at least played once. So it's in that sense that this is where art is. And that's God for me. It's, it's, it didn't exist before. It's God saying, hey, expand the universe, expand knowledge. It's Mozart, it's Bach. It's, it's it, the, the, the famous story of Bach. And he's playing in the church and he runs it's a high man. He runs at, He runs out of score. He turns. He flips the score and plays it stuff backwards. That, as my teacher would point out, that was the end of Western music. It was so perfectly written that he could turn the score over and read it backwards, and it worked. That was the end of it. It's like, well, God, how far? You can't go any further. It was like Charlie Parker. He played all the changes. There was nothing left to change to play. Everything else was a repeat from after Charlie Parker. It was before and after certain things in nature. That is what God is saying. Now go further. That's what art is 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 meant, and that's what Orisha is. It says, "Who are Orisha? Orisha are women and men who, after some great trauma or end of life cycle of their life cycle." <clears throat> that led to an act of transform transformative self-sacrifice were either buried by earth or water and then selected, that word again, selected, after careful and serious reflection to be honored for their characters and deeds that redefined the possible and ushered in new ages. Their sacrifices metamorphize them into lasting bodies of moving water, hills, sacred spaces, and natural phenomena that enduringly captured their spirit energy slash ashe that could be invoked to perform curative services for their descendants and devotees. It's like, in, if you've ever been to Brazil, you go to you go to Bahia, and they have a group called they call it Caboclo. <clears throat> it's it's a it's a big samba group. They, that's the the, the the negative, not the negative. It's just the simplified way of saying it. It's not just a samba group. It's the Filos de Grandes, the sons of Gandhi. They dress. In blue and white, because the blue and white are the colors of my Orisha. We share that Orisha. Oh, Batala Ogian, especially. So I even wore blue today. I said, let me put on blue. This is why, because people think white, but it's blue and white. And it's blue for the Segi beads. I was going to put on beads, but I said, eh, let's not get too formal here. Um, because those beads are considered very, very valuable. They're very valuable beads. 
And when people wear them, it's, we have a saying, I can wear those beads and not have any shirt on that's beat my bare skin and I'd be fully dressed. Because they say the beads and my title means that I'm fully dressed. I don't have to put anything else on. I'm wearing everything I need. The beads, those, those blue beads, those segi, they're very ancient beads. They're some of the oldest beads in the world, actually, but let's not go there. The point is, all of that is this idea of turning people into monumental forms. Not all people can be a mountain. Not all people can be a river. But there are so many categories. There are some people, I have two trees in my backyard. They've been here since we've lived here. They were here when I came. One is a silver maple. Every so many years, we have to top it off, take 20, 25 feet off. <laughs> and the tree is looking down. On, I live in a four-story townhouse, and it's about three stories above my house now. And my neighbor said, Mr. Mason, are you going to, why don't you cut that tree down? <laughs> I said, darling, that tree was here when we came. All right, and we've been here before you guys came. And that, we don't kill trees. So that tree, we're going to try and bring it down. So I have one more time I'm going to do it before I get too old to be bothered. And I'm going to pay. And then my children, are gonna, they said, you want that tree chopped? Bring it down 25 feet. You hire the guys because the next time it's going to probably cost an arm and a leg. But the point being, those two trees are sacred. Why? Because they're living trees. One is a, is a silver maple and the other one is an Indian bean. All right? Indian bean, which is a whole nother story. I won't tell you all the history. The point being, those two trees live here. They own this land just like I own it. And they were here before I'm the interloper coming to this land. We have to respect the spirit that governs those trees. The bodies that, remember, I don't know if you know, anybody knows this. This part of Brooklyn, this was, this used to be a lot of cemetery. Was Bed-Stuy was big cemeteries. So we don't know how many spirits are living in these big trees because they have big trees all through this neighborhood. You go in people's backyards and you can see trees sticking up, looking down on homes and knock on wood. <laughs> I got to knock on. We, we haven't heard any bad stories about trees running, falling and knocking down houses yet. So God, God is like, okay, they want to stay here. We want to stay here. They all, we, we live in peace with them. So I res the point being, it's like going, as I will point out, let me read so I can, I won't, you won't think I'm just running my mouth here. Um, it says, uh, it's going on, okay. Um, it, met it metamorphizes them into lasting bodies of moving water, hills, sacred spaces, and natural phenomena that enduringly captured their spirit energy, ashe, that could be invoked to perform curative services for their descendants and devotees. That power is not, if matter can neither be created nor destroyed, then it can be tapped into. That's the construct. That we can always tap into knowledge. That a dear friend of mine, he's, I believe, listening to this now, wherever he is, he was a Yoruba from Ijesha, Igbajo was his town. He came for divination. And we were sitting downstairs. And I started talking from the Odu about his mother. And there was a crash. I thought somebody had thrown a, a, a boulder, a, 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 a brick, through my front room window. But we had very big windows. And I said, oh my God, what, who the hell is throwing rocks at this time of night? Because it was, it was already dark. 
And I get up, I go to the front, I look, nothing. Windows completely intact. And I'm thinking, so I came back to the, I said, Ojo, oh, I could have swore somebody broke through my window. He said, no, no, Baba. You talk so strongly about my mother. That was her energy that you called to strike that window, to let her let you know, let me know, because it was him that she was signaling that. I had called her spirit to come back to the house and come and she didn't, the window was the only thing that stopped and she hit the spirit that force hit the window. And I'm thinking, cause I took my hands and got, I, I, I knew somebody had thrown a brick to me. I'm thinking who the hell's out there throwing bricks this time of night? He said, no, when we checked, it was his, it, he was absolutely right. And he said, you spoke about her so strongly. There are certain times you have to be, we, we are trained. You have to be careful what you say. It says, oh, it says, Lenu. It says, you have to be careful what comes out of your mouth because you say the wrong thing. Things, bad things can, and good things too, but bad things can happen. And sometimes it's not, so it's even, it teaches you to control even your your, your anger sometimes. Sometimes people get to the point where it's like, you know, you're lucky I'm old. Because when I was younger, this would this this would have ended very badly for you. Why? Because <laughs> so that is what this is is implying here. That this idea that this energy, this energy is available to be tapped. That it's it's coming and it says, it's, re, it's not just for their descendants, and devo it's, but anybody who believes and has the ability to attach themselves to this energy. So this is not based on ethnicity. And let me say this right from the beginning. There is no such word as race. There's only one race, human race. Everybody else is ethnically <laughs> inclined. So you, so that it, Hey, that's <laughs> race was an invention. All right. It was needed in order to create a social dynamic, a certain anyway. <laughs> I'm not the social scientist, but um those of my colleagues who are have we have talked this over over many years, and it says, John, don't use that word because and even the idea of the Yoruba being a tribe, when they're not tribal, they're ethnics. So that there's the Oyo are one ethnicity, the, the Ijesha are one ethnicity. So that this idea of ethnicity is, is key in this. So that this idea um, that spirit can be attached, it can be made to do work, it can be called upon. Why? Because everything is liquid and negotiable. That means everything. If, if, if nothing can disappear and no, everything is in flux, well, disappear to our, you can't see it, but that doesn't mean the air ain't there. So, or that when you feel the wind, it says, well, I can't see, I don't see anything until the thing pierces your, your until the, the, the board is gored by the straw. And then you understand who all ya is. As a, I, there's a, there are many poems that I have, um, Oriki poems, praise poems. And it says, do you, you want to understand terror? You've never been in a tornado. He says, you want to be terrified? There's, they got stuff for you. Nature can terrify you because you see that water coming. You see that wind and all the stuff that the wind is, is picked up and says, hey, you want to see some terrible stuff? Guess what? Stand there for a second. I'm going to see what can go through you, what can be embedded. You know, it's worse than shrapnel. So it's all of that, that this is implying. And it says that knowledge production, original or not, is ongoing. As is language production, the naming of things. So it's the same way if life is constantly renewing and rechanging and reshaping, then everything is also. And that's 
from that perspective, that's what that's what Orisha and Europe, that's the Orisha construct, that we're all in motion. Everything is in motion. And divination at any moment is only a snapshot. Click now. Tomorrow it could be different. The day after is different. Why? Because if everything is in motion, then you have this moment of calm. And then there is this, it's not calm. And this moment. So it's in that sense that it's everything is in flux. People are of the earth. We are the consciousness, the knowledge, the internal knowledge of the earth. Mankind shares consciousness with God and Orisha. As we work out our lives, we increase our and God's consciousness. God's consciousness, the universe, is expanding. God and the Orisha need the experience created by humans, animals, plants, and minerals, collectively and individually, vis-a-vis -vis great souls, slight, um, sl slash exemplary lives. The beauty of great souls like Osiris, Confucius, Mary, Christ, Muhammad, entice God slash Orisha to want to possess them in order to have intercourse with them and to learn. Intercourse doesn't mean they're screwing. It means having dialogue. You, some things you can't know until you talk to it, until you, be, you, you live with it. It's where we began this conversation. You have to actually know who your mother, you know, I know people that, like, like the same crazy people I'm telling you about, the psychopaths, they knew my mother and they loved her. That her love, her sweetness, her simplicity penetrated their insanity. It was perfect for me and my brothers because it kept us it kept us on the good side of the storm. But for a lot of other people, they weren't so lucky because that insanity didn't protect them. But it's in that that we that this construct is 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 implied that this idea that God and the select that there are certain great spirits that people want us to possess, that people, that you have, like a baby. You know, there's a reason the baby has a round face because it makes that that little <laughs> enzymes and endorphins jump off and we want to, we don't want to throw it out the window. We want to hug it. We want to kiss it. That's why dogs, puppies, all those little animals, they have those little round faces so that we don't just, we don't get rid of them. That we, we, tr we, we, something in our chemical makeup tells us take care of that thing. Don't, don't, no, don't, don't, don't abuse it. Well, guess what? All of that is what even the Orisha, even, well, people that study Orisha, we have to understand all of that. Why? Because it, it's, it's part of our being. It's, it's what makes us go in certain ways and makes others not go in that way. Because sometimes you understand, well, why? How can people do X, Y, and Z that seem so inhuman, so uncaring? Because sometimes the message didn't get where it was supposed to go. That, and again, for us, it's about how do we know that? Because we learn that everything doesn't want to be, you don't want to hug everything. Well, we have a joke, at least I know, I assume black people have this joke most, at least that I've ever, I've never heard it, other people say it. They say, you know, that's an ugly baby. And he says, oh, but is it, I love her. He says, yeah, but that's an ugly baby. And that was a friend of mine used to say that. He says, you know something, that's a baby only a mother could love. So that there is that sense that every, every person is not huggable. It's not lovable. It's not, it's, you don't want to be with every, but, Nature has set it up so that we're going to get the majority of these of these beings hugged and loved, all of that. So Orisha proclaimed as reflections on the ideologies of the spirits and deeds of great beings transcends blood ties. Orisha are not about family. 
that these ideas, these great per figures, these great um, archetypes, they transcend blood ties. It's not about your mama or your father or your sister or your brother. This, this, go, this includes them and everybody else so that it implies that this idea of ethnicity has to be jumped too. That's the other issue. And this, for even the Yoruba, for Orisha people, this was, was, was something that had to be dealt with because in Cuba and in, in the Americas, under slavery, when, when whites discovered this paradigm of power, this paradigm of philosophy, of knowledge, they said, well, wow, can I, can I learn that? Can I get into that? For a long time, it was forbidden. And I can understand, I, 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 as an old lady told me, she lived to be 103, the priestess of Yamoja, her point was, you know, she would allow whites to join her family, to be under her direction. She had a very interesting way of saying that. She said, they can join, they can't, but that doesn't mean I trust them. Different ages, different people. Why? Because they understood this process, this dictum in our culture. Slavery made it a little hard to swallow. That had to be reconstructed, reconfigured. And not just, and believe me, I've been too many places with too many people who are no longer with us, much more brilliant than I will ever be. Men and women who wrestled with this very same problem, they were saying, how do, we, how do we stay human? How do we maintain our humanity in the face of this atrocity? And the fact, how do we then in, embrace others who were part and profit, still profit from that atrocity? That became an issue. I wrote about it, but it would be dishonest of me not to mention it in this construct. Why? Because that is still at play in the world. And it's, <laughs> shit, if, if, what we gotta do is look <laughs> look at Ukraine and, and, and we think now these are Russians and, and people that speak Russian. And, and if you wanna talk about you, inhumanity to man, um, and we can go on and on, but I won't labor with that because it, it takes us too far afield. The point is, this idea, it's, it, it has to be understood that this was, this, these are considerations. These are things that are in deep consideration in, in the Orisha community and the Orisha community at large. We're not talking just here in the United States. The United States is the, the youngest member. Americans are the youngest member of this, of this conversation. So you, you, go to, you go to Brazil, remember more Africans were taken to Brazil than all the rest of the Americas and Europe combined, okay? And you wanna talk about who are, you wanna go and study Orisha? You gotta go to Brazil, you gotta go to Cuba, you gotta go to Trinidad. And you, and you talk about deep pools of knowledge. The point being, they've all, at least in my experience, had to deal with, with issues of this nature because it becomes an issue of, and even with their own children, <laughs> yeah, because a lot of their children were very modern and wanted to be modern and wanted to embrace this and embrace that. And the and the 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 their mothers and grandmothers and grandfathers who had been under the lash and whatever else um, didn't quite understand their being so now forgiving and liberal. So all of that is in play in this conversation, this thing here that it says. These great spirits, and you have to see it in, in line of that, that every culture, every ethnicity develops great spirits, great, great spirits that God and the ancestors want to embrace. They want to bring into their, um, into, into their um, realm. 
And that then levels the playing field that people have to understand that, that chants, prayers lead to possession, which is oneness with openness, oneness with openness to sight of the divine. Ashe, power, God. Ritual drama rejuvenates our spirits by retracing and reliving mythic journeys and resolving age old problems. Transpossession harnesses the magical, transformative switch power of the existential leap. Shango jumps into our time to remind us of all the hero and scoundrel problem solvers he is the sum total of. Devotee swells and becomes more as divinity squeezes in and presses against bulging eyes while causing tongue to misfire. Like Orisha devotees, Pentecostal adherents speak in tongues. Our spirit is there a passenger in our own body. Words are poor ambassadors for a heart brimming with the soul's true glimpse of paradise. Possession is that point. It's where there is this idea that to become the other, to embrace divinity, that divinity can now in, in become embodied and can come for work to deliver messages, okay? It's, people think of the Bible. Well, maybe people don't think of the Bible. I'm thinking of the Bible. You think that when they were, when the, the apostles after, after Christ had been crucified and risen, they were in the upper room and the tongues of fire came upon them. The Holy Spirit came upon them. They received the spirit. They became possessed of the spirit of God. Sometimes people think, oh, it's that spirit that comes in possession to, to learn to speak with the, with the tongue of God, to learn to speak with the tongue of the divine. Not just the Orisha, every culture that has, remember, everybody's an African, genetically speaking. So that idea, that methodology traveled the world. Every culture has that type of transformative ability to, to invite the divine to come and, and commune with you. That is, is key because it doesn't make God or his emissaries so far off from us that we cannot have contact, we, we cannot have instruction, that we can take it very personally. That is, is, is key to this conversation here because it's about, we can bring Shango and it, and, it's 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 this predates Christianity, so let's let's not get this twisted. It says, "Where you join together in my name, there I am too." That's basically that's African construct. You know, remember Christ was in the scene as John the Baptist was, so that this idea of them studying in North Africa, studying in Egypt, studying other ways of thinking about divinity, about the, the ascetic view that you see this in India, that the idea of denial, of, of re refusing the body so that you free the mind, you free sensibility. All of this is, is part of Orisha. It's the idea of going into seclusion in, in, when, in initiation, that you are deprived. And where uh, my daughter, we were talking about this, my, young, my youngest daughter, I said, for, a, for over a year, for a year, nobody can touch you. You are no longer in the world after initiation. That it's, and in some, we don't, it's hard to do in, in a society. We have to go to work or I was a teacher, I remember, and I was a musician. And, but in other societies, you go and live in the temple. 
You don't, for a year, you stay away from people. You, you are sequestered. Why? Because you haven't been born yet. You haven't been born to this world. You've been, init you've been, in, you've been born into the world of spirit. And spirit has now communed with you. But you are not, you are not born yet. You are not of the world. And because of that, this becomes important to know that here we are and you jump, this magical jump, where all of a sudden now, from time immemorial, here comes this, this we, you invoke this spirit, you invoke this force. It has a name, it has a method of, of acting, it, it has um, a way of acting. There is a method of calling it. There's music specific to it. There's a there's movement that's specific. This is not we're not calling up Chucky or or or, the, or um, any of these other hobgoblins. No, these are ancestral and national spirits that we call. Nobody freaks out when you say we're we're honoring George Washington that nobody, when, when you do a movie about Abe Lincoln and, 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 and somebody impersonates him or looks, gets to look like him, or you do stories so that these great national images, every culture has them and they find ways of reconstructing them when it becomes valuable for them to actually do work service to, to the community, to the nation, to, the, to, their, to, their, to their state, to their city, to their government. All of these things, because they can be brought out and said, no, look, look at the example, especially if, if you know, especially when they've been cleaned up and, 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 and the example is not, not a negative one. So we're not gonna, do, we're not gonna mess up Jefferson's plan, you know, oh, Monticello, oh God, how wonderful. Yes, but every, farm has a scarecrow, as a friend of mine used to say. But that doesn't make the farm not a good farm. So it's in that, that each of us has skeletons, or each culture has national heroes or whatever with skeletons. So all of this is part of, of this issue of calling down these powers, calling down these ancient ideas, that have that were maybe in some in many cases they were embodied in actual living beings, so that we can talk about Malcolm X, we can talk about every that every Rosa Parks, pick a name, um, and they, they are part some part of these ancient ideas have caught them have embodied they've been in the embodiment of. And that for us becomes critical. Why? Because now they can teach us something and they can teach us something in our time and in, in, in real time, in our face that we can see it. It's not something that says, well, that, I, you know, are there any pictures of Shango? Yeah, I'll show you Malcolm. I'll show you this one. I'll show you that one. There's, here's, here's this person there. And we can, and forget the, you know, the top 10 as a friend of mine used to say, you mean the top 10? Malcolm, you know, Mark and, M Malcolm X, and Martin Luther King. Yeah, okay, those are the, t but then there are how many others that we don't know about, that we find out about later that embody these, these um, wonderful spirits of invention, of passing, moving the, moving the culture forward, just like the apostles, just like all of the, um, when we talk about the lives of, of the saints, that's not just, um, remember, how many saints went all over the world? They went into China. They went into, so that you have to consider that they, again, this idea of moving an ideology, a, a way of thinking, a methodology forward. And again, diaspora, same word, in a different, and it's not under force, because when, I remember a Jewish friend of a rap, was a rabbi, I believe, and he said, Oh, but you cannot use that. You can't. He, he got a little bit touched because I used the word diaspora. I said, excuse me. When we use the word diaspora, we weren't forced to move anywhere. We move because 
we want to expand our family holdings so that we went from point A to point B. The idea that everybody was not under duress as when they said, let's go explore another frontier. So that for you, for your group, it might have been under duress. For a lot of other, for, for the majority of others, it was basically let's see what's over the other over the hill. Or for the Polynesians, I'm sure they weren't saying, "Well, we, we, you know, somebody kicked us out of out of heaven." No, they were saying, "Hey, isn't that an island way the hell over there?" And they traversed the ocean, and they traversed the ocean, and they and they populated, and now we're finding out <laughs> they came back. They went all the way around and came back into North America, so that. All of this idea of movement, of calling great heroes, great sheroes to invest our youth, invest our being and, and instruct us, that's key to Orisha. All of this is key. And hopefully I'm not taking this too far afield. 